So I'd never written a sitcom, so that was one thing that I felt I, I ought to have a crack at, to see if I could, you know, work out how, how the form worked. Fab's got a documentary. Frederick Delia, syphilis-ridden genius. Mm. <laughs> well, I might watch that. Oh, no, I can't work in here. Do What's that? <laughs> Half past four, documentary. Is it true about the syphilis Delia Smith? Delia Smith's never got syphilis. <laughs> How dare they? Don't tell me a woman with spotless tea towels would stoop to that kind of infection. I wanted to do a workplace comedy because I didn't want to do a domestic comedy because I didn't like domestic... I don't like, you know, mother, father, grumpy teenage daughter. I don't like all those sitcoms. So it was going to be a workplace comedy. It was going to be a group of people and that, that you only saw in their work setting. So everything to, you know, to find out about them, you could only find out from what they said to each other in casual conversation. I really think you should be sensitive to a woman's hormonal ebb and flow. Oh, I am, believe me. Look, I'm not a dinosaur. I quite like women in a sad, baffled sort of way. <laughs> but can we please get a grip? Out of a workforce of five, at any given moment, one will have premenstrual tension, one's panicking cos she's not, someone's having a hot flush, and someone else is having a nervous breakdown cos her HRT patch has fallen in the minestrone. <laughs> that was a one-off. <laughs> could tell instantly it was obviously a Victoria Wood script, so... Uh, and she crammed so much uh, into her scripts. You know, every episode you could watch two or three times before you have realised everything that's in it. You know, I had a story that went from week to week and I had a lot of characters coming back and forth and, and, and made it as complex as I could make it because I did want people to be able to watch it more than once and still get something from it. It looked like they were closing off the flyover. Could be dodgy. Will that matter? No flyover? Well, that's our main route in. Oh, no. One day, something went terribly wrong on the tubes or something, or every which way I tried to get in to the oval where we were rehearsing. Um, I couldn't get there, and I was... I really lost my temper. Stan, please, tell me what is happening with the traffic! Well, Phil Henderson used to be a traffic warden, but a mixture of non-stop verbal abuse and bunions made him rethink. Now then... That's enough! I rang her up, saying, I can't get there, you know, this tirade down the telephone. Does every simple query have to come with a side order of spleens and bunions? <laughs> I need to know what's happening with the traffic. Next week, I suddenly had this tirade to do for the millennium. And I thought, she's very clever. I don't need to know the life history of every blasted idiot that's ever worked in this stupid godforsaken factory! <gasps> <laughs> is one of my favourite bits. <laughs> this is Maxine Peake, who's not done any acting at all, have you? Not even this afternoon you didn't do anything. I knew that Cheers recorded their final dress rehearsal and then they would give notes and they would make changes before they did the final evening show. And I said to Jeff Posner, you know, I would really like to do this because I think until you've done it once in front of an audience, you don't really know where the laughs come or where it sits and, and what you could improve. And he said, which was a very clever idea, he said, well, let's just do it twice. But with dinner ladies, we'd do a show on a Friday night, then we'd have rewrites. Rewrites galore on that. It was terribly hard work. She kept right rewriting all the time. She'd stay up sometimes till four o'clock in the morning and she had two small children then. I said, did you sleep all right? No, no, I've been up all night rewriting. God, another load of learning. Saturday morning we'd be hoiked in and then say, gather round for notes and rewrites. Thelma and I would look at each other and go, oh, you just have to keep relearning. And things would be cut and changed. Sometimes she would say in the morning, oh, that scene isn't working properly. Somebody bring me egg and chips and I'll write it again over lunch. Ten minutes later, we'll come back, and how's that? And it's there. And it's totally from left field, you know, something totally different. And it was always better than the one she'd written. But you had to learn it all over again. <laughs> oh, Flip, this job is a nightmare. Julie and I both thought it was a bit like being on an ice ring. I said, yeah, well, you can't skate. I used to take all these things for my nerves, like um, sort of herbal things, nothing terrible. Julie and I were behind the flats taking every sort of herbal remedy we could to try and, you know, keep ourselves together. We were all sniffing it before we went on. Oh, suddenly so a section of the audience could see us, and I thought, I bet they think we're at the amyl nitrate or something. God knows what they thought we were doing. 
Yeah. I know, I know. And it was really full on. It was really high pressure. And, and some people did find that. I, I understand that that's nerve wracking, but we just wanted to make it as good as we could make it. Well, I suppose it was quite pressurised, but everyone tries to be nice and calm. But uh, the person with most pressure was Victoria. What are you doing for Christmas again? I told you, I got these three carry-on films for eight quid. You don't get the boxes with them, and there's like a stripe running down the side of the picture. But... You want to come to Scotland with me, Christmas Eve? My mate's got a pub up there. I can drive up there after we've finished here. Do you want to do that? Yeah, yeah, I would. I would like that. One of the, the uh, main things was Victoria Wood and my kiss that we had as Tony and Bren. Apparently, that was the first time she'd uh, done that sort of thing. <laughs> in public on television. I'm not asking you for some bet, Brent. I won't do that to you. I always remember the rest of the cast uh, peeping around the, the set, you know, going, <laughs> So embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't bothered about it really. I didn't. It wasn't a big deal. I mean, it wasn't a big snog or anything. But what was funny was when we did it, all the audience went woo, and you can hear them. There's only one thing I didn't like about dinner ladies. I was never asked to be in it. I'd have given my right hand to have come on as a lorry driver. A bin man, anything to be in that. Dinner Ladies really, for me, encapsulates everything that Victoria's best at. It's observational, it's character interplay. I tell you who's nice that I like. Who's nice that you like, Brent? Woody. Alan. Woodpecker. Who's Alan Woodpecker? <laughs> great script, great cast. By Jove, you cracked it. I mean, I couldn't see any of the cast and uh, dinner ladies playing any other part in that show. Whoops! Didn't realise I was popping into hunk heaven. <laughs> it's much better if you can write for specific comic people because, you, you know, they take something and they run with it and you know what they're going to do with it. Has she told you what a terrible mother I am? I am terrible. Put her in an orphanage and lost the address. <laughs> We laugh about it now. <laughs> it was a, a, a great atmosphere. And because we knew each other, I understood, suddenly I understood why people do work with each other again and again. I mean, I once was in a sketch that Vic had written and felt strangely uncomfortable about it because I had a kind of confusion in my head of uh, learning the lines and having Vic there slightly directing it. Um, and I thought, oh, this is all wrong. This should be Susie Blake or Celia Imrie or one of those really clever women. Is it Harold who's supposed to have a bit of a party piece? Oh! All he does is struggle to force the theme tune from Cagney and Lacey out of his... Uh, bottom? <laughs> no. Out of his ocarina, I was trying to say. <laughs> bottom? How could somebody get a tune out of their bottom? <laughs> there speaks a woman who's never gone camping. <laughs> And the negative side is when I see Duncan Preston and something else, I'm like, I thought I was going to be a proper actor. You know, a classical... Um, I was, I did, you know, I did Stratford and things like that, and I never thought for a minute I was any good at sketches. I'm pro probably right. Good morning, sir. Is Mr Dickens at home? I think he's writing Dombey and Sun, sir, but I'll go and see. Are you famous? My name is Wilde. Oscar Wilde? Well, I'm not bleeding Marty Wilde, am I? <laughs> She's responsible for about 86% of my income over the last 28 years. Good morning! Hi there! I'm Sally Cumbernauld. This is Martin Crosswaite. How are you? Oh, chipping in already. <laughs> <laughs> I think because of, of how brilliant she is, um, she's always going to be the Cohen or in the centre of the other jewels. Um, but they all just make her shine all the brighter. Better get used to our ugly mugs, cos you're going to see a lot of us. Oh, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love him. Um... There's a shorthand when you work with people and you know their working methods and you, you can just crack on. 
but then it's always really interesting and exciting to find new people and work with them and work in a different way. Otherwise, I think you get stuck in a quite a cosy rut where you've always got your old pals around you. I think that's not good creatively, which is why the last few things I've done, I've ducked and dived a bit with the people I've worked with.